And then the fifth guy gets up there and says, we changed the DNA of your immune system to attack the cancer and you're cancer free in a week. I'm sitting there going, excuse me, can you back up and say that again? You're listening to Philly Who, the podcast that tells the stories of the doers, thinkers, and performers of Philadelphia. My name is Kevin Schmidlin, and today I'm chatting with Richard Vague. Richard is a managing partner of Gabriel Investments, a former co-founder and CEO of two banks and an energy company, an author, and the president of the Philadelphia Live Arts and Fringe Festival. In this episode, you'll hear how Richard was born and raised in Texas, but when the bank he co-founded grew to a national level, he relocated to Delaware. There, he would co-found a second credit card issuer and would work to develop a state-of-the-art credit card for Apple. I felt like I was getting a lesson. They were thinking of possibilities beyond what any of us had thought about. In the early 2000s, he noticed unsettling patterns in the debt behavior of Americans and decided it was time to move on from banking. He didn't know it at the time, but he had predicted the 2008 global financial crisis. I remember taking it to the CEO of Barclays and saying, you know, shouldn't we be concerned about this? And his response was, no, talk to our chief economist and he'll explain to you why. Before writing a book about financial crises and starting a third company, he moved his life to Philadelphia. Here, he fell in love with the city and quickly became a driving force in business, art, and science, as evidenced by his involvement in Philly Fringe, the Franklin Institute, the Museum of the American Revolution, the Pennsylvania Academy for the Fine Arts, the Tourism Marketing Corporation, the Arts and Business Council, and the Penn Medicine Board. And I believe the history books are going to say that cancer was cured in Philadelphia and it happened at the University of Pennsylvania. So Richard Vig has probably one of the most prolific business resumes you'll ever see. He's a three-time co-founder and CEO. He's the author of one and soon to be two books about global financial crises. And nowadays he's a successful venture capitalist. And even though you can see his love for art and creativity reflected in his abundant support of artistic organizations around Philadelphia, Many don't know that he has creative roots himself. In fact, when he was growing up, moving around Texas, he had no plans on going into business at all. His plan was to become an artist. From the time I was three or four or five years old, I was an artistic enthusiast. and I would draw and paint and draw and paint, and my parents you know, did the obligatory thing and sent me to the little art classes after school. And, it got more and more serious, so by the time I was in high school, I had done enough and competed enough and that I had just I just assumed I was going to be a an artist, a, a, a fine artist. Right. What did you love about painting? You know, I loved the figurative aspect of it. I loved painting people. So, you know, it was didn't matter if it was ordinary people or sports or historical characters, you name it. Uh, we uh that was the thing I loved the most. And I, you know, I don't know, it was just a compulsion. Yeah. And, you know, it was a compulsion that lasted a long time. Right. So then you said that you got sort of sidetracked into business. So at what point was, you know, art no longer the path? You know, the thing that happened to, to me is I, I developed a lot of friendships in high school. And we got interested in philosophy and theology and things of that sort. So I got deeply involved in academic type pursuits and in studying theology. And we, we belonged to a church that was a terrific church. And a lot of our life was centered around that. So I began to think of myself as, you know, more and more of this academic. And, and uh, so by the time I got to college, I actually wasn't thinking about business. I actually, we actually thought that anybody who took business classes was kind of humdrum. You know, I would take biology and calculus and differential equations and, you know, uh, historical linguistics and philosophy courses and certainly history courses. And we just felt like we'd died and gone to heaven. <laughs> so, but the business guys were the humdrum guys. Now, I didn't realize at the time how exciting business could be. I just made the assumption that, you know, academic and intellectual pursuits were the thing to do I, you know it was kind of a tangent in my in my childhood and it was a lot of fun and but you know that's kind of the path I started to take and um, somewhere along the line you know two things happened to me 
one of them is I was putting myself through school. It was a state school, so it was inexpensive. So it was, it was very feasible to put yourself through the school in those days. I put myself through school, but I ran out of money. <laughs> so I had to take a year off uh, to earn money to go back to school. I went back to live with my parents, and I got a job. And it just so happened the job I got was at a bank. And that's how I got introduced <laughs> to the world of business. And yeah. it, was, it was pretty exciting, you know, in its own way. And I had a little job that, in retrospect, was a very minor job. But I thought it was the biggest job in the world. And What was it? I was doing account analysis. I would get information on a customer's loans and their deposits. And I'd add them up and put them on a page and do a little algorithm and come to a conclusion about them. It was very formulaic. But I thought... I was doing the most important thing at the bank. You were on top of the world. <laughs> I was on top of the world. And I understood banking, and which I didn't, of course. And But that really um, got me the money to go back to school, but gave me my introduction to business. Gotcha. So when you did get back to school, did you have to change course and say, I want to study business now? Or did you sort of stick with the philosophical type education until you well, graduated? At that, at that point in time, you know, I was on my own financially. And I had already been at school for a few years. And... I realized I had to get a degree, and I had to be able to make a living. So I got real practical real quickly, and I so I actually got a degree in communications with uh, a concentration in advertising from the University of Texas. And I continued to work for the bank, and my relationship with the bank was such that a very fortuitous thing happened to me, and that is when I graduated. And these were not large banks. You know, this was way back in the days before banks had become the national things they are today. I work for the local Austin Bank. Uh, University of Texas was in Austin. Uh, and upon my graduation, they gave me the job as the head of advertising for the bank. So that was my first big lucky break. They I mean, just gave you the reins right away. Right away. Wow. Of that particular department. So all of a sudden, I was out of college and I had a pretty substantive job. Yeah. So if I would have asked Richard at that point, you know, you got, you're going, going into that job, what's your career going to be like? Would you have said that you'd just stay in advertising? Well, I kind of thought of myself as a banker almost immediately because I've been working, you know, in account analysis at the bank and I'd written a procedure manual for the bank. And then all of a sudden I found I was head of a department. You know, I thought of myself as much as a banker as I did an advertiser. So if you'd asked me then, I would have said with a burst of, you know, 21-year-old enthusiasm that, you know, I'm going to be a banker. Yeah, and you became a banker. I did. That you did. I did. So it was in, what, 1985 that you co-founded First USA Bank, correct? Now, how much time in between that first job and co-founding your own bank? Well, it's a little bit more complicated than that. Our bank was acquired by a Dallas Bank's bank. And given the responsibility to come up with a consumer banking strategy for the whole company, which at that time was probably 15 banks. And so, among other things, we aggregated the credit card business of those banks and started operating that on behalf of the entire company. And then calamity hit. Uh, Texas Bank started getting into a lot of trouble. This was the mid-80s after the oil collapse. The only path they had to try to save themselves was to sell the good parts of the company. And ours was one of the good parts. And so, to make a very long story short, our division was sold, and the way it was sold was in a leveraged buyout. We actually uh, found a sponsor in New York Merrill Lynch. So we became an independent credit card issuer overnight, largely uh, as a result of this misfortune of our parent. Our parent, like all Texas banks, was a big oil and gas lender, and oil and gas was in a terrible shape. And so there we were, a credit card, an independent standalone credit card issuer. Yeah. It was only a couple of years until as I understand, you started to expand to different locations. And that's what brought you up to the Northeast. Is that right? At that moment in the credit card business, there had been a certain changes in laws and regulations that allowed for the expansion of a credit card business. But in order to take advantage of those, you either had to be in 
Delaware or South Dakota. After evaluating both states, we decided to move to our business to Delaware. And that's when I personally packed up my bags and moved to Delaware and became a resident of this part of the country. And that was your first time not living in Texas. That was my first time not living in Texas. And, you know, that whole thing came together in the course of just a few weeks. Yeah. So being a Texan to being a Delawarean, you know, happened effectively overnight for me. And by the way, that that too was very exciting. You know, I'd always been a fan of, you know, a lot of places in the country, not the least of which is places like Philly and New York and others. So I just thought I'd died and gone to heaven. You know, I got to relocate to an exotic place in the country. And and remember, I I became bank president when I was uh, 29 or 30 years old. So this was, you know, at a time in my life where, you know, I welcomed every adventure. Oh, and things were moving. So you become president of the bank. And how did that go? Were the first few months, years, did it, did it go well? Did you enjoy it? Did it live up to what you thought it would be? Yeah, it was just, you know, you, looking back on it, it was just a perfect moment to be entering that business. It was a very unglamorous business at the time. You know, it had been the case in Texas banking that if you were a rising star, you were in oil and gas or real estate, and then the rest of us, like me, got kind of dumped over into consumer banking, and which was not the case. That was not the case in other parts of the country, but that was the case in Texas. So I had found myself in what was viewed as an unglamorous business. We were standalone. We had all sorts of opportunities. And then kind of the stars aligned. And our business became a business that was a very much of a growth business. So it was a very vibrant time. You know, we grew very rapidly and did a lot of things. What, what were those stars? What changed that enabled such quick growth? One of the things was that we could now issue nationally. You know, you used to have to grow this business state by state. And one of the changes was you could now market credit cards across the United States. Uh, the second thing was, you know, in retrospect, uh, it was an small or underpenetrated business. Not very many people had credit cards at that time. And then uh, the other thing that happened is that interest rates started to uh, drop. And interest rates coming out of the early 80s had been as high as 15%, which is hard to think now that interest rates are like 2 or 3%. I can't imagine right? that. <laughs> it was my reality, you know, for, for a long time. And suddenly it dropped down to mid to low single digits, so that just created a profit opportunity that hadn't existed. So the combination of those three things, and there weren't a lot of, a lot of highly skilled competitors at that time compared to what was later the case. Fast forward to 1997, First USA would then be acquired by Bank One, correct? That's right. So at that point in time, it's been what's 10 years since you moved to Delaware. Are you still living in Delaware? Still living in Delaware. We, and we had gone public on the New York Stock Exchange between 92 and 97, we were the best performing financial stock in the country. We returned about 100% per year to our shareholders during that period. And then uh, Bank One uh, made an offer for us. Yeah, and when that happened, how did you feel? Were you excited? Did you oh, we were that? We were very excited. You know, I knew, you know, the, you know, I knew that it would be different having you know, a co- large corporation as a boss and f- effectively, but I also knew that their requirement of me was only to stay a couple of years. So uh, after that point in time, I'd be free to find a new adventure. Find the next thing. Because what, it had been 12, 12 years since you were independent, let alone starting out in the bank at that point, you're ready to move on to a new adventure. So a couple of years later then, things weren't going so well, were they at Bank One? The banking industry as a whole, Bank One included, started having troubles. But, you know, I, it was time for me to move on and we went out and found, you know, the internet was the new thing. That would have been, I guess, you know, the late 90s, which was what we now think of as Internet 1.0. So it really gave us the opportunity to, to go out and try to do something in the internet space, which we, we started something called uh, uh, Juniper. You were ready to leave. You left Bank One and then started another bank. So that was the difference between Juniper and First USA was that you were working online now? Yeah, we, we wanted to do something that was much more internet oriented. At First USA, we had actually pioneered, you know, online credit cards with clients like AOL, if you remember, you know, right. back in those days, AOL and Yahoo were the big names. Yeah, yeah. And 
we had we had recruited both of those as business partners and had issued uh, credit cards in conjunction with them and any number of other internet so it was an exciting time we were very much oriented in that direction and a few of us had been at first usa started a new venture that was we even tried for a period of time to take deposits over the internet wow even though you know that didn't work as well as we wanted but you know things went well and we we grew pretty fast in that venture yeah too. yeah it grew fast uh eventually would be purchased by barclays became barclay card us i believe is is what Bar it is now barclay card usa yeah still uh, blowing and going yeah hey i mean this this uh, computer that we're using is is pretty much financed by their Apple card. So, <laughs> so yeah. I that was a deal I personally signed. By Did the you? way, with with Apple. Well, thank you. I have this beautiful machine. Thanks to you signing that, that deal. Was, that was, <laughs> you know, flying out to Cooper Tino and meeting yeah. with Steve Jobs and oh, wow. the I, folks out at that time. They were very. Yeah. What I, was that like? Let's digress a little bit. How was that? I mean, because that that company is legendary. Steve Jobs is legendary. Just the whole. I think they epitomize what people think of when they think Silicon Valley and this this new, you know, 21st century workplace. So what was it like to visit there? You know, even at that time, you know, they had just hit their stride that we still see so vibrantly today. And it was very exciting to go out there. They were selling computers. And I think probably at that point in time, it was still like the iPod and things like that. And, you know, they were starting to boom. And Going out there was a lot of fun. They were very, very, at very high standards. You know, we we first talked about issuing an Apple credit card. And at, the, and at that point in time, MasterCard and Visa had a requirement that you put MasterCard or Visa, the name, on the front of the card. Okay. And Steve Jobs wouldn't hear of it. <laughs> and, you know, the, the card was a piece of plastic. Well, Steve Jobs had his own materials group. And, you know, as they were examining with us the opportunity of the card, they actually sent their own materials group to the credit card manufacturers trying to find substitute materials for the, for the card, you know, be it carbon or whatever. And, you know, they tried a hundred, literally, a wow. hundred different designs for the card and ultimately stopped short of actually issuing a credit card with us and instead did the financing of the computers online, which we handled, became one of our biggest, most successful relationships. So, you know, even though it, it didn't end up being a credit card per se, but it was it was incredible to deal with those folks. You must have, I mean, what were you thinking when you're like, man, this it's just a credit card, right? Like at, at this point, like they're applying the same design practices to just the credit card. I felt like I was getting a lesson, yeah. you know, that, that you know, that... Uh, they were thinking of possibilities beyond what any of us had thought about. And so I, we loved it. I can remember being on the phone with MasterCard and Visa because, you know, cause they didn't. And, and they were, it was more than that. They wanted to change our pricing rules within the industry, which, you know, nobody, you know, thinks that expansively. So I remember being on the phone with the president of MasterCard and Visa trying to talk them into this idea of letting a card not have the name on the front you know, different pricing, you know, different materials, potentially. There was a lot of reluctance and I'm sitting there going, this is Apple. Yeah. And, you know, we ultimately didn't get it there, but I think it shook the industry up enough to where it set the stage for changes yeah. that, that came. Wow. Wow. That's cool. But I remember meeting jobs and there he was, you know, he always wore a black shirt and blue jeans, either blue jean shorts or long blue jeans. Right. I, think, I think his logic was, you know, that reduced the number of decisions they needed to make that he needed to make in the course of the day. But it was, it was yeah, exactly the same where that he had like a hundred or like a thousand of the same turtleneck made just so that <laughs> he could have that one extra decision. That's crazy. Uh, so it sounds like he, he lived up to the, the character that we know him to oh, be. He was, he was a force. So the journey per journey went a lot quicker, right? So it was what only, only six years until you moved on, correct? We had pretty good success with the company. And then we, one of our investors was TD Bank out of uh, Canada. So we developed, you know, great relationship there, but it became time to sell. And so again, we looked around for a buyer. And in this case, we flew over to London, met with Barclays PLC, one of the legendary banks in the, you know, out of London. And so it was the same kind of deal. We got to sell. 
We were asked to stay for a couple of years to facilitate the transition. I was flying over to London once a month to participate in management meetings. And I could I had that down to 36 hours. Yeah. I could fly <laughs> over there, land, you know, took take the red eye over there, yeah. be there for an eight o'clock meeting, you know, go to the meeting, go to a dinner and fly back the next morning. Wow. So I did that once a month for a while. Once Richard sold Juniper Bank to Barclays, he and his team decided to explore other industries rather than to go back into banking. Coming up, you'll hear how they stumbled upon an opportunity to start an energy company right here in Philadelphia. And later, Richard will tell us about the medical research he's involved in at Penn and how he thinks that Philly is on track to be the city that cured cancer. Stay tuned. This episode of Philly Who is supported by The Civic, an adaptive reuse apartment building at 16th and Girard, where I used to live. What used to be a hospital is now well-designed micro, studio, one, and two bedroom apartment homes for rent. True to its roots, The Civic is centered around hospitality and community and has amenities including a roof deck, an art gallery, a doorman, a golf simulator room, a pet grooming station, and more. To learn more, to book a tour, or to just thank them for supporting the show, visit thecivicphl.com forward slash Philly Who. The link is in the show notes. Welcome back to Philly Who with Richard Vague. After selling Juniper Bank to Barclays in 2004, Richard and his team were ready to start a new venture. But they recognized that the credit card industry was pretty mature and that there wasn't much room for another player. So they set out to find a new business that might complement their skill set. We stumbled across this brand new industry, which was the deregulation of the electric utilities. You know, lo and behold, it lent itself to the skills that we had. We, we could just take what we already knew and lay it on top of this industry and, and grow it. And sure enough, we grew that uh, our business from you know zero sales to I think you know close to 500 million in sales within like three to four years. Yeah, and now this business was headquartered in Philadelphia. We headquartered right down the street in the Science Center. Wow. So yeah, at what point? I'm guessing at this point you lived in Philly. I had personally moved to Philadelphia while I was still in the credit card business, and just loved it. You know, it, I'd spent my entire life being a a suburbanite to that point. And it was an opportunity to live in the middle of a city, which, you know, I love then and I love even more now. So I'd made that move and the gentleman who I'd been working with for some time, who was uh, instrumental in this utility business as well, Kevin Kleinschmidt, also lived in Philly. So it was very, very obvious and natural that if we were gonna start a business, it was gonna be in Philly. So this was, what, 2007? It would have been 2007, seven eight that we really got started. Now, this is around, this is just before the financial crisis. Now, you, you wrote a book about essentially predicting the next crisis, I guess, after the one that was imminent. And that was about how private, you know, a, surge, a resurgence in private debt is what causes these crises. Now, at this point, when you, when you leave, the consumer credit card industry did you did you have those feelings like did you start to see something that ominous we did we had for in my entire credit card career which was you know a long time we had done monthly analysis of the entire consumer banking industry nothing ever happened with those those the information we got from that report was minimal because it was relatively stable and then, then in starting at about 03, we noticed that mortgage loans were growing astronomical pace. You know, we kept looking at that 04, 05, 06, it kept growing rapidly. We wondered more about it every year. I remember taking it to the CEO of Barclays and saying, you know, shouldn't we be concerned about this? And his response was no. Uh, talk to our chief economist and he'll explain to you why. And this economist explained to us that even though debt was going up, the asset values of consumers were going up even more. 
Of course, that's a very circular logic because the asset values were really the appraisals on homes, which were fueled by that debt, and stock market valuations. So, you know, kind of doesn't matter because if your mortgage, if you got a big mortgage, you still got to pay that monthly mortgage. So even though we got that explanation from folks, we kind of, and, you know, at one level we said, fine. At another level, we knew that to pay those big mortgages, uh, they were either going to have to sell those homes or something, refinance them or what have you, because they were, it was, the debt levels were just too high. And that even though we weren't in the mortgage business, that was going to spill over and impact the credit card business. So that we, there was no place to hide. We had no inkling it was going to be a global yeah. <laughs> catastrophe, but we knew it was going to be a consumer lending problem, you know, at a very large scale. Yeah. So in retrospect now, does that experience change the way you look at data or even just trust your gut after you Without know? question. Yeah. I mean, that really began, that was, uh, you know, in 06, 07. I have, since that time, almost on a nonstop basis, been uh, studying that subject. And we now have a database of 47 countries. We have private debt information on all those countries. We've developed very specific algorithms to almost predict right. problems. I've just finished a second book that will get published this year on the history of financial crises in the six largest countries in the world over the last 200 years. So we've done in-depth studies of 1825 in London, 1873 in Berlin, 1907 in the United States, you you know, the Great Depression. Right, of course. So it it absolutely began a material change in my feelings about data and my commitment to studying the subject. Is there anything that you see, financial or not, today that sets off alarms that people may not be listening to? Well, I th- you know, we've expressed this, but um, uh, the area of concern in the, in, in the world right now is Asia, is China and its satellites. And we're starting to see this. And that was, in fact, something that we predicted in this 2014 book and in subsequent articles, that there's just too much debt in China, but also in you know, the satellite countries of China. That includes South Korea, Australia, any number of others. And we're starting to see a little bit of an unraveling now, which we think could have been foreseen. Yeah. So let's let's bring it back to Philly. You founded Energy Plus Holdings in 2007. 2011, it was acquired by Energy. So it sounds like you did find the wheelhouse that you were looking for uh, when going into a new venture. Is that right? We did. We found a, a perfect situation, grew it fast, had a very successful sale to NRG in 2011. Was it... Was it fun? <laughs> it was a lot of fun. You know, I give an enormous amount of the credit for the success of that to my partner, Kevin Kleinschmidt, but it went very well. And, you know, it, it, it'd, be, it'd be hard to imagine a situation work better than that one. Yeah. Thinking back to these three companies throughout the time, do any particular moments come to mind as particularly triumphant, like a, a day where you were like, wow. I can't believe I'm doing this. I can't believe this worked out. I've had the good fortune to have a number of those moments that, you know, and and we knew all the pitfalls and the perils along the way. We were acutely aware. I was personally acutely aware that if something a little different had happened at this point or that point, that the whole thing could have gone a very different direction. So, you know, I'm, I was grateful then and I'm even more grateful now for the, for the, but yeah, when we took the company public, you know, we were in the New York Stock Exchange ringing the bell. That was one of those moments. When we sold Bank One, that was one of those moments. When we sold NRG, that was one of those moments. Yeah, there was there were a lot of a lot of very special days. What was the most difficult day of I guess those years? You know, we had we had a lot of difficult days when we were trying to uh, finance the LBO and we talked about this earlier when our parent was failing because of the energy situation in Texas and um, we were trying to sell the company and we ran it. There were days, there were days that were effectively over. You know, we'd get a legal ruling against us on something that was important. Uh, uh, I remember being in the office of the general counsel of the federal reserve in Washington, DC and effectively having, and that's about as high as you can go. Right? Yeah. There's no appeal. <laughs> and, and, and having uh, him say something that 
would have seemed like it had doomed our ability to do the leverage buyout. And, uh, you know, there's a level of despair or fatalism that comes with those. There was, there were any number of moments, you know, when we did our uh, startup in Juniper, there were moments, you know, we had to attract a lot of startup capital and there were moments where the, the amount of money we owed and the amount of money we had in the bank were, there was no similarity between those two numbers. And, you know, there, there were, there have been many moments where I thought it was, and it, it had all ended and that was going to be a complete failure. Yeah. So after energy plus holdings was acquired by energy, how long until you started getting into venture capital? Well, we had actually, you know, I felt like I'd done three companies, the, all three had worked out pretty well. And, we knew the need in Philly was acute for startup. Capital. How did you know that? Well, we were we were were kind of because we ourselves were a startup. We had kind of gotten to know a lot of the early stage folks. You know, folks like the late Steve Goodman, who was such a mentor to the startup community here. Any number of folks like that. We knew that Philly was one of those cities that you know there was a ton of startup capital in Silicon Valley. There wasn't even a fraction as much in Philly. So that was something that was needed. And it was something because we had started three companies ourselves. Uh, we knew at least something about the process and felt like, you know, not only could we invest, but we could assist companies uh, with, you know, advice and judgment. And so we were eager. We actually were doing a little bit of it uh, even in the days before we sold to NRG. At what moment... In your mind, did you go from, I live in Philadelphia to I am a Philadelphian? Are there any moments? As I said, when I moved up to Delaware, we came very close to living in Philadelphia at that time. And I always, you know, I be, almost instantly became a Philly sports fan. And, you know, I, I used to go to Cowboys games yeah, I know. when I was in <laughs> elementary school. You know, Roger Staubach was on our board of directors at one point in time. And, you know, and, and became a good friend. So, but when, when I got here, I came whole hog, yeah. you know, and uh, so I had always admired it. And when I had the opportunity to move, which I can't remember the exact year, but it would have been like 04, 05, something like that. You know, that was it. I was 100% Philadelphian. And you know, whether Philadelphia accepted me or not, I embraced yeah. Philadelphia. <laughs> From the day you opened up that door for the first time, you were you were here. You were you were Philadelphia. I can I remember standing on the corner of 18th and Walnut and saying, you know, my goodness, this is this is where I ought to be. I've been there. I love that. So you're heavily involved in fringe arts, and you're chairman of the board. I am. So how did you originally find fringe arts? Well, I had you know since early in my life, I'd wanted to be an artist. I have always remained involved in the arts. Yeah. And the way to do that, if you're in business, is as much as anything, is try to be supportive financially. You know, be a member of nonprofit boards, make contributions, and the like. And you know, through a mutual friend, uh, I had been introduced to fringe arts, which, as you know, is you know, kind of inventing the theater and dance of yeah. today and tomorrow. And I joined the board, and then was asked to to become chair, and have remained very deeply involved. Yeah. What, what do you love about fringe arts? I love art that's being made today. You know, I'm a huge Pablo Picasso and Claude Monet fan, but you can't rub shoulders with those folks. What I love to do is see what's being done today and what's being done tomorrow and meeting and uh, getting involved with the artists that are trying to make this happen. And fringe arts is that kind of experience. And we've we really, you know, our objective is to put as much great art as we can in front of as many people as possible. And in the time I've been there, uh, we've acquired a building. You know, we've gone from 16 days a year to 365 days a year. We have the Fringe Festival in September, but we're launching, we're in the middle of launching five, uh, four new festivals. For next spring, we're launching a new festival just for up and coming theater and dance groups called Hip Fizz. We're launching a comedy festival. This is avant-garde comedy. It's called Blue Heaven. We're going to be launching a circus uh, festival. And we're into the second year of our jazz festival. So we're, 
we're we've gone from no building and one festival to a building and five festivals during the year and we've recruited top level talent to to lead that organization i couldn't be more excited yeah do you remember at one moment was there like a show or or some sort of exhibition where you saw the art and you thought to yourself i have to be a part of this yeah, I can remember because, you know, this is still true to an extent, but it was especially true back in the old days. Since there was no building, they just had to go around fine, and there was places to be. And this was the basement of an unfinished building where this particular show was. I wish I could remember the name of the show, but it was just riveting. They were, It was two actors. The audience was 15 people. Wow. And I'm telling you, it was transformational. And I'm sitting there going, we need as much of this as we can get. That's great. Oh man, it's that's crazy that you're launching four festivals in one year. That's so much. Yeah, we got our fingers crossed, but it's going very well. Yeah, yeah. Well, hey, we just did so we just did Philly Who's first live show at Fringe Arts as a part of uh, Philly Startup Leaders Founder Factory, and that place is so much fun. The way that it opens up into the restaurant, like that the the sort of auditorium area, is so so cool. I think. The changes that we've made over the last couple of years are going to completely transform theater and dance and more probably in Philadelphia over the next generation. Wow, that's amazing. So far uh, in the journey of Gabriel Investments, what has been one of the most exciting moments for you? We're doing something uh, in a little bit uh, in a nutritional space right now, a company called M&I that has uh, come up with something that can be life-saving for underweight premature infants and others and it's it's some of the best scientists yeah. in nutrition in the world are part of this company and you know, seeing something happen like that where they're creating something new and they can change people lot people's lives yeah. is very gratifying yeah another way that you're helping to change lives is through your involvement in cancer research at penn uh now can you tell me about the the moment you first heard Dr. Carl June talk about cancer treatment? I, you know, I I felt like, you know, I needed to start. You know, I'm 62, and you know, there's at some point in, along the line, you need you feel like you need to start becoming more aware of health and medicine. Yeah. you know, as you're advanced in years, and so this is about seven or eight years ago now that I uh, went to a conference on the most advanced research in cancer. And there were five speakers, and the first four were, um, you know, more of the same. It was like, you know, more radiation, a little bit different chemotherapy, a little bit different nutrient, you know, whatever it was. And then the fifth guy gets up there and says, we change the DNA of your immune system to attack the cancer, and you're cancer-free in a week. I'm sitting there going, excuse me, can you back up and say that again? I couldn't wait to get involved in that. You know, your whole life, you know, we, we've heard, you know, that the most important complicated problem out there is curing cancer. And, and, you know, and it's almost a metaphor for something that's impossible. And I believe the history books are going to say that cancer was cured in Philadelphia and it happened at the University of Pennsylvania. So Dr. Junis said that you took a risk on him when no one else would. Why well, I, well, I certainly wasn't the only one, but there were there were critical folks before me. Yeah. But let me tell you, this is one of those things where this was different. He had very limited funds, and he had this trial to treat, I believe it was, four individuals. And the only folks the FDA would let him treat at that time were very elderly with terminal cancer. So these were all folks in that, I believe their 60s and beyond. And in three of the four, it worked. But that was all the, the size of the trial they could afford at that time. And then very shortly after that, kind of the breakthrough story occurred where they found a solution for another type of cancer that affected children. So there's this young lady named Emily Whitehead, who was seven years old at the time, who was Within a month or two of dying, everything had been tried. They had tried, uh, you know, all the, you know, the chemo and radiation and all the other things. None had worked. There was no treatment available for her. Uh, that the Whitehead family heard about Carl's effort, brought her down. 
it's a much more complicated story than I'm about right. to say, but she got her T cells taken out of her body, genetically re-engineered, reinserted into her body, and in a matter of days, the three and a half pounds of tumors inside her body had been killed, and she was cancer-free. And it has been six years since then, and she's just as cancer-free today as she was six years ago. Why, why don't more people know about this? Well, the story's getting out because now there's several hundred kids that have been. Yeah, this story is getting out more and more and more, but that's part of the reason I remain involved is we, we, we not only need to tell the story, we need to continue to funding the research because we need to make a breakthrough in some of the, you know, the, the, the kinds of cancers that have been cured. The FDA wouldn't approve of me using that word, but... Right. Um, are what are called soft tumor or liquid tumor cancers. And we need to have the same breakthrough in some of the hard tumor cases like pancreatic right. cancer and glioplastoma, which is brain cancer, and a few others. Uh, and there's money pouring in. We need more of it for trials in those areas. We're seeing new breakthroughs almost daily over there. In fact, I was communicating with Carl yesterday. If we are responsible stewards, and by we I mean not just Carl and his group, not just the University of Pennsylvania, I mean the city of Philadelphia and the country are stewards of this effort, we could find that we have cured cancer. So I've seen, I've read a quote, correct me if I'm wrong, but it says that you've said that there's as much opportunity for creativity in business as anywhere else. What's an example of where you've seen this sort of creativity in business that you see anywhere else. See it all the time. And this, you know, this kind of gets back to what I was talking about when I was in college is, you know, I figured, you know, business was just guys doing what had already been done. And you went to work and you did some boring thing for eight hours a day, but there is as much opportunity and it's inventing new products. You know, clearly the iPhone is one example of that. Uh, um, I consider uh, what's being done in medicine and, What's being done with Carl June is uh, the medical business because it's now been taken over by Novartis uh, uh, and is being deployed around the world. So, you know, whether it's inventing a new product or inventing a new process or procedure, uh, it, inventing a new way to market an existing yeah. product, the single most important thing in business, in my judgment, in in this world is uh, is creativity. When I was in my early banking career, you know, we would have a new product breakthrough once a decade. I, I think this was the 80s um, that uh, the federal government allowed banks to start paying interest on checking accounts, which was a radical breakthrough, an industry earth shattering breakthrough. Well, compared to what go is going on today, you know, there was one breakthrough a decade back then. There's one breakthrough a day. Right nowadays if not more so yeah i think the premium on creativity and imagination and the ability to execute on uh, the ideas you come up with is as important yeah. as anything there is i love that it's so encouraging i think the general masses feels that way too we're losing that overall thought that it's creativity or business or profit right so i, th I think that's really really encouraging because I've always believed that creativity is not a skill, it's a mood. Like anybody can be creative in the right, if they put themselves in the right environment, right? It's not like I'm not a creative person. It's, well, I may not be in a creative mood right now. Um, so I'm glad, well to, said. I'm glad to hear you say that. Um, so I have a couple of questions that I ask every guest just to get different perspectives. Um, what would you say is a common misconception about you? Perhaps it's uh, folks not being familiar with the creative uh, side of my past. Yeah. Thinking I'm just more of a serious business guy. Right. You're involved in a lot of organizations and boards too, correct? How do you, how do you balance all that? Well, I've been very fortunate in my life to have the opportunity to do this, that sort of thing. But I, I really do feel like we're on this earth to help each other and that we're here to make a difference. And that's what motivates me. If you could send a message to yourself in the past at any moment, butterfly effect aside, so you really like, you know, wouldn't lose everything. What would you say and at what time period would you send the message? I, I do wish I could take the things that I know today and give them to the 20 year old me. Right. Because, you know, I could have gotten a hell of a lot more done. <laughs> so but it wouldn't be just one thing. It'd be this whole book. Right. You know, of experience. What would you say is one one piece? I think what I have learned about human nature, you know, we developed over a period of 10 or 20 years a belief in what is important 
and the people we hire, the people we do business with. And it took a long time for me to figure that out. It was kind of trial and error. You know, first you say we ended up with 20 something thousand employees and, you know, we had to hire a lot of, we, we had to make a lot of mistakes to, you know, kind of figure out exactly what kind of person we wanted to work with. And, you know, that the characteristics we ultimately came to value most were, you know, intelligence, creativity, but also unselfishness and honesty and you know we we're at a point now where those are the four things we insist on uh and i wish i could tell my 20 year old self those things and how to go about assessing those things and that would help yeah you think 20 year old richard would have listened to the advice you know 20 year old richard wasn't a great listener <laughs> <laughs> right because it's one thing to get the advice it's another thing to follow through <laughs> maybe he would have maybe he would have from your perspective what would you say is the biggest challenge facing philadelphia today i think so many things are going well. I think, you know, the biotech stuff that's happening at Penn uh, and the investment Penn, and Penn has a co-investment program right now where they're investing up to $50 million over three years and 15 startups a year. I think that alone may change the face of Philadelphia in a dramatically positive way. Uh, you know, we still have a bunch of structural issues related to the city. We have the tax on uh, the, the profits tax on businesses, which is a different form of tax than almost any other major city and kind of keeps businesses from headquartering here. You know, city government, getting city government where it's more conducive uh, to the vibrancy that that's possible, uh, I think is at the top of my list. And then on the flip side, what would you say excites you most about Philadelphia? Today? Well, I, th I think it's the, the bio. We're about to have. We lead the world in immunotherapy. And, you know, we, we did an analysis. We did a presentation a couple months ago. We did an analysis of um, the genetic engineering companies that are in Philadelphia right now. And, we, and this, is, this is something that didn't exist a few years ago yeah. anywhere in the world. Yeah, it wasn't even a thing. And now there, we, by our estimate, there's 30 companies in Philadelphia that are, that are genetic engineering company, including... Sparks Therapeutics, which is the lead tenant of Schuylkill Yards and is in the process of hiring 500 folks, many of which are these MD, PhD type researchers. So we, we think there's probably already 4,000 jobs in town that relate to this industry that didn't exist a few years ago. There's a subset of generic engineering called immunotherapy that we absolutely lead the world in. As I said, you know, we're We've got 30 companies. We may be adding as many as 15 a year the next three years through Penn's leadership. Uh, I can see 20, 30,000 jobs uh, associated with this industry just within the next few years. I think if that happens, Philadelphia becomes a different city and, and becomes the global leader, uh, certainly one of the global leaders uh, in something that is as important as anything there is. Yeah, wow. So I don't usually ask about sort of current events because the show is a little bit more retrospective storytelling time agnostic but over the past week i've seen some mentions of you potentially moving considering moving from philadelphia to washington i was very concerned after the november 2016 election as a democrat part of my concern was that the democratic party wasn't focused on and wasn't really focused on the the challenges and issues of the middle class so I kind of took it upon myself with some very capable professional assistants uh, to go around the country in small group settings with uh, middle class Republicans and Democrats, not asking about political candidates or, pol you know, this arcane policy or that one, asking about their lives and have really, I think, figured out some of the things that matter most uh, to the broad uh, middle class in America and and don't really think that even my own party is as focused on that as it needs to be and you know, I want us to win in 2020 you know not for my sake not for my party's sake but for the country's sake and so I have as I've gone through this and I've visited with hundreds of politicians you know on this subject matter and what I'm learning 
uh, you know, that that is a thought I've entertained. Yeah, something that you may have to just step in and, and help directly, right? <laughs> yeah, that is absolutely a possibility. For more on Richard, you can check out the show notes or head to podphillywho.com forward slash vague. That's V-A-G-U-E. If you like the show, be sure to subscribe. And if you're on Apple Podcasts, leave us a rating. It really is helpful. You can follow along on Instagram and Twitter at podphillywho. Philly Who is a Q9 production. This episode was produced by me with associate production by Angela Gervasi, editing by Max Graham, music by Lee Rosevere, and artwork by Lauren Carhart. And a special thanks to Max Tuttleman. For Philly Who, my name is Kevin Schmidlin. Till next time.